Good morning, Professor Richard. Thank Good morning. you. So, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to our students at the ANU today. Um, I'll jump right in. This week, we're exploring the topic of accountability in our course in public sector management. And I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions about um, current practices and accountability. The first one is, you know, we, we've Governments are increasingly relying on external parties and agents in the delivery of public services, such as prisons or the provision of employment services. So how effective are traditional accountability mechanisms in non-hierarchical networks? Well, that's a, very good, that's a very good question, an interesting question, which has exercised a lot of people in the last 20 years or so. Um, the short answer is not very good, not okay. very well. The, um, the consensus seems to be that you can have reasonable accountability for outsourcing if you can define the uh, objectives clearly and monitor for them clearly, and so you have really little loss of control. So the, the standout successes were always things like cleaning, rubbish collection, um, a few things like catering and other things that people do around the public service, which are clear function and you can, um, and you can save money by actually outsourcing because for better or worse, you don't have to pay people so much. The contractors employ all their own friends and relations, no employment expenses, no appeals for merit appointment, et cetera, et cetera. So outsourcing is efficient and can be accountable if you can control it. But outsourcing has moved from those basic functions to much more complex functions. And here people are um, connected, as you say, more by networks than by hierarchy. It's not a question of just writing a clear contract and employing someone to do it. You have to join in a partnership with shared values, hope that they'll be on the same page as you are. And then it becomes much more complex and complicated. There is no direct accountability from the other network um, partners through the hierarchy, obviously, by definition in the network, you have to rely on other types of accountability for the network participants. If they are independently accountable, perhaps to their own clients, if the, particularly if they're in co close contact with their clients, they can do it. And also, of course, in areas where the contractors share the values of the public service, which is often, you know, in terms of charities and so on, mm. providing public services, they can be relied on to have the good of the public at heart up to a point. However, um, they are not exposed to the degree of accountability that public service departments are. And on the whole, I think that there's a loss of accountability mm -hmm. um, in the sense of direct accountability to the public, the ability of the public to know what's going on, the ability of the media to, to um, throw up um, questions and expose faults that is that is weakened i think mm -hmm. in terms of uh, of terms of networks so there's been a, an accountability deficit mm -hmm. with networks i don't i don't doubt that okay. is there anything that governments can do to address this accountability mm -hmm. deficit in networks or something they have to work yes, around there are some things they can do um, they can expose the members of the network, the private sector companies, to more accountability processes that the public sector um, is normally exposed to. For example, um, one can require that the private sector partner is um, open to the Auditor General, mm -hmm. because Auditor Generals provide a much tougher audit than mm -hmm. private sector auditors do, and they, have, they, they produce reports in public. So I think um, <clears throat> Australia, under pressure from Auditor General and the, and the Senate committees, uh, require that outsourcing contracts uh, include a clause that Auditors General um, should have access to aspects of the <clears throat> network partners' activities which related to the mm -hmm. delivery of the public service. Then they're never going to be accountable for how they spend their money. Mm -hmm never going to be able to haul them before a committee and say why did you all go off um, <clears throat> go off to Hawaii for a conference traveling business class when you could have done it and they'll say well that's all right that's part of our business model mm -hmm. um, we delivered 
-hmm. So, you know, it's not your business. Uh, but you can expose them to the Auditor General. You can also expose them to parliamentary committees more. Mm -hmm. Again, this has to be written into the contract. Okay. And there's resistance often from the partners and say, well, we're not going to um, contract if, that, if we're exposed to all of these degrees of, uh, of accountability. So, and I think a lot of the people who are in favour of um, outsourcing are not too fast about accountability, to be frank. In fact, they see it as an advantage. Mm -hmm. A lot of private sector critics would say the problem with the public sector is it's too risk averse, it takes too long, mm -hmm. too consumed with keeping records and mm -hmm. worrying about you know, gotcha moments when things go wrong. And if you want a sort of a more um, cavalier attitude and a more willingness to cut corners in the interest of efficiency, then you'll reduce accountability. And so that's the, the hidden trade-off. It's hidden, as I say, because people aren't usually honest about saying it like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, many of our students are from developing Asia, and I was wondering if we could move a bit towards uh, talking about accountability practices in developing countries. Um, could I ask you a bit about, if you could reflect a bit on some of the constraints in promoting accountability in developing economies? Well, there are, there are, there are a lot of constraint, potential constraints everywhere, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends, I think, on the case-by-case -case basis on the um, strength and independence of particular institutions. That's my experience. I don't have direct experience of having lived in a developing country, but I've taught a lot of mm -hmm. students from the region over the years. And my experience from talking to them and from what I've read is that you need to build upon, as it were, pockets of independence that you can trust mm -hmm. to do the accountability functions of asking the questions, exposing the information, forcing um, rectification, etc. the sort of classic functions of accountability. So it might be that you have um, a strong media, mm -hmm. or you have strong elements of the media, in which case you try and um, reinforce them and encourage them, or maybe that you don't. It may be that the, there are problems with the media. That's one area. It may be, for example, I mentioned auditors general before. Mm -hmm. It may be that um, particularly countries can be encouraged to have or have already strong supreme audit institutions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of effort has gone in, in, into that. If you have a strong auditor general, it can't be bought off, mm -hmm. then um, that's an advantage too. A lot of effort has recently gone into anti-corruption agencies too, mm -hmm. which have been wrongly seen as some sort of panacea mm -hmm. and have often been established as simply as a sort of uh, fig leaf Mm -hmm. um, by countries that want to get money from the IMF and mm -hmm. World Bank and so on. So I oh, will set up one of those and then they white ante it from within. So if you have a, a genuinely independent anti-corruption agency, that can work too. Again, the same applies to parliament and parliamentary committees. Mm -hmm. Each of these traditional accountability functions can work if, if encouraged. Um, but there's no silver bullet. It's a question of finding the areas where there's most likelihood as it were of getting getting some purchase on the system and being able to open it up but it's difficult and it's very challenging and no governments ever like accountability mm -hmm. australian government hates accountability their, their first instinct when the virus came was to close down parliament yes. and it's only after certain resistance that they agreed to have one committee from the senate to look at what's going on now they um, because of the protest, they, they've agreed to bring Parliament back. So, um, you know, you're always working against the interests of government. Right. So if you we want to come back to Australia right now, you spoke yeah. about the government's response to the pandemic. And something really unusual in Australia was that the Prime Minister convened a national cabinet, a sort of intergovernmental decision-making body. Um, how do you view this in the context of existing frameworks of accountability? Um, <laughs> good question. The, the, the standard answer to that is, I think, that it's not a very accountable organisation because the body as a whole is not answerable to any body or person. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's composed of a number of leaders who are separately, separately accountable to their own parliaments. Mm -hmm. But as a group for the collective decisions, they're not accountable to any this parliament. There's no... Um, national parliament mm -hmm. um, or any any 
accountability body. There's no national auditor general. There's no um, the national institutions of accountability. So this is sometimes referred to as executive federalism, where the decisions get made, the federal decisions get made at the executive level. And this may be, this may be quite efficient sometimes, particularly if there's a, there are incentives for them to work together, but it is weak on accountability. Um, federal, federalism, of course, is um, notoriously weak on um, accountability because each side can always blame the other mm -hmm. and it's always hard to get anybody to take responsibility we're in we're in a crisis at the moment so um, i think people are prepared to forgive so long as the objective is pretty clear we've got to get over the virus the prime minister is taking a, a, a sensible sort of collegial approach trying mm -hmm. to keep the differences with the states papered over or hosed down and worked through by negotiation. But it's certainly only a temporary measure. Mm -hmm. Adversarial politics will uh, and conflict between the um, federal and state governments will um, re-emerge just like that as soon as there's an opportunity. Right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Richard. I'll, I'll stop there. I know you're very busy. I won't take up much more of your time. But our students are really, really thankful to you for this opportunity to speak to them. Well, I wish them all the best. All right. Thank you.